So I, I can start off just echoing some of what Phil Murawski had said in terms of, well, to make it very simple, like he had said, don't trust the scientists, don't trust the media, all right? That could be a very simple way of talking about it. But there are great complexities, and many of us know quite well uh, a number of these complexities, where science and policy are shaping the way in which mass media is taking place, the processes and the products of mass media. And then conversely, it's feeding back. Mass media shapes scientific inquiry. It shapes the kinds of questions that are deemed legitimate. It shapes the kind of policy alternatives that, that have a greater voice, that are more dominant within these wider discourses. So it is a much more complex space. So on, on one level, this is these are ways of knowing and these are interpretive lenses. And on another, these are information sources. At best, they're watchdog sources and perhaps a lesser uh, optimistic note that they're problematic in certain instances. This was outlined yesterday a bit, and uh, I can touch on that as well. But all of this together, I do want to say we can, we can unpack and excavate this notion of trust, but it contributes, in my estimation, to a latent, to a passive, and sometimes active trust. How we define that of faith, uh, hope, confidence, we can, I'm certainly happy to have that discussion, and I think that we should. So my title talks about this notion of trust and mistrust, contents, discontents. I guess there are a number of levels in which you can interpret that. I uh, don't mean to, to imply any kind of binary thinking about this, but rather working through the spectrum in the US and UK case studies. So um, I don't think that I need to take too much time either to talk about the role of the mass media and its importance, as evidenced by the panels that have been composed. The organizers have, have recognized that this is important. Um, and many people through time have been increasingly taking a critical look at how mass media shapes this science policy practice interface. To take one quote, Lance Bennett has talked about this importance of mass media in public life. I guess I could just simply ask all of you a bit of participation. In your specialist fields, how many of you wake up on a typical morning and take a look at the recent peer-reviewed literature and put that in front of your, with your cup of coffee and your <laughs> eggs or cereal. How many of you raise your hands, go ahead and do that, within your own specialist field? Okay, we've got one <coughs> shining example, Wes Shrum. How many of you, alternatively, rely on mass media sources, television, radio, newspapers, internet? How many of you raise your hands, rely on that, even within your own specialist field? Even within the areas that we presumably in which we're experts, we're relying on this as a, as a big piece of translation uh, to help us make sense of uh, various facets of science. There have been many polls, and I'll get back to this towards the end, about uh, a number of the different polls that have been taking place, garnering mass media's influence in public understanding, more specifically trust in climate change. Uh, but here's one, a BBC poll from last year, showing that television and newspapers had, have dominated this landscape within these 10 countries that this has been the most important news source in an average week. There have been there are a number of great news organizations. Uh, Journalism.org does a real good job in the United States talking about the changes and trends. But this is the case as it is. And, and this is perhaps rationale, but it also reasons why I've been looking at and focusing on television and newspapers uh, in my work. So here's a bit of a, just a, maybe a cheeky, representation of mass media coverage over the last two years. The top comes from some of the work that Richard Somerville and many others have been doing from the IPCC fourth assessment report. This is showing the increase in the temperature anomaly over time, showing that both natural variation and human contributions are playing a role in global climate change as it is now. And the bottom graph is depicting number of news articles. This is a, a segment of newspaper coverage from uh, quite a while back and up through. And maybe like the infamous <coughs> hockey stick, you can see that there has been a tremendous increase in mass media coverage. And we'll get into the detail about, about these various ebbs and flows. This is uh, just looking at English-speaking newspapers here. Uh, 41 newspapers, 17 countries, five continents. It includes Canada in this case. Just to give you a sense of this quantity of coverage <coughs> and then maybe to help argue that this is increasingly important in this climate science policy space. I do want to say two things, though, uh, before I proceed. And one is that when I'm talking about these complex interactions between climate science, policy, practice, mass media, these are not meant, the critiques are not meant to be individual attacks. They're not meant to be, to be uh, attacks on individual journalists as they uh, undo the work uh, that they presumably do to the best of their ability. Uh, 
that rather this is looking at some of the institutional features of these interactions. It's not to focus on mass media either. But there is tension that takes place. Individual activities, some people more influential, influence these institutional processes. But the focus for me has been on these institutional features. And then just another real quick piece is that climate change is a larger question, larger than global warming. But within mass media and public conversation, usually these are used synonymously. For my purposes, I use them interchangeably, but global warming is just dealing with that temperature facet, just to dispense with that, so, Richard. Uh, asking from where does the science come? There's been a lot of important work done in this space. This comes to you from The Onion. I do have California connections, but I, I'm raised in Madison, Wisconsin, home of The Onion newspaper, which some of you are hopefully familiar with. This, I just want to quickly as moving into this, ask from where does the science come? And this, is, this deals with ways of knowing, and, and people such as Sheila Jasanoff have been looking at this. Many of you here have been looking at these questions for years, and I am just focusing today on what's considered the managerial scientific community. Uh, Neil Adger and others had talked about this juxtaposed with perhaps this more participatory, grassroots, experiential-based knowledge. This is drawing its authority from the science itself, from the scientific method, top-down processes, and macro-level focus. And hopefully to provide some continuity with Richard's presentation as well, one of the prominent examples in climate change is a, there's a great opportunity in that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is a, is a great example of this managerial scientific community. From top climate scientists on planet Earth, consensus processes, largely seen as this legitimate communicator of climate research. Largely seen. Now there's quite a bit of debate. This is a heavily politicized body, uh, just won the Nobel Peace Prize, sharing it with Al Gore. But this is, this is how these spaces are being organized, albeit politicized. And they aren't translating truth, as it were, that this is, this is one proxy for getting at uh, the science of climate change. Taking that just a touch further, ways of knowing policy-relevant honest brokers. Policy-relevant refers to one of the explicit uh, statements from the IPCC that they are not performing policy prescriptive, uh, they are not doing policy prescriptive work, but rather it's to be relevant to policy. The second part is that this notion of honest brokers, Roger Pilkey Jr. just uh, published a book talking about the honest broker and the different institutional as well as individual roles that scientists take from issue advocates, uh, a mythology of pure science to this role of an honest broker. Taylor and Buttle had, had um, written what I consider a seminal piece of work, How Do We Know We Have Global Environmental Change? This was part of a larger project back in 1992, and pointed out that global environmental change is particularly vulnerable to deconstruction. And this, this to take it further with Steve Rayner, and these are things that we've been discussing already so far, Steve Rayner talks about how we live in an era where science is culturally privileged and the ultimate source of authority in relation to decision making. But we know that science is not capable of delivering the kinds of final authority that are often ascribed to it. And so this can, this can raise a number of issues that we've been pursuing in terms of how the pursuit of scientific knowledge, as it were, can raise new questions, often leads to contradictory certainties and uncertainties. And this is what complicates, as we've been discussing, this Mertonian ideals, this, this, this notion of the linear model, information deficit model, and so forth, that it is a complex and contested space with many feedbacks uh, on many levels as well. And to just demonstrate that, Peter Brooks made mention of this um, somewhat, and, and others have also made mention of, of the lineage of various communication models. This is a model by Car Annabella Carvalho and Jacqueline Burgess that takes a look, at, this is based on work of Stuart Hall and many others, in, in cultural studies, in science communication studies. But I find it very useful in terms of looking at the multi-scale factors, pressures, and processes. Perhaps like fine wine, this uh, you might need more time than I'm going to give you to settle into exactly what's going on here. But what I, my purpose for presenting this is to show you that in this context of political landscape, economic drivers and factors, social conventions, and so on, the production of news into the public <coughs> sphere, which occurs above the axis here, and this is the passage of time, involves the framing, power of framing, the choice of how you're going to tell the story about climate change. This moves into the public sphere, 
and competes in the attention economy with many other important pressing issues of the day within science and also within other political social issues, war in Iraq and otherwise. That this then moves into this private sphere of citizen engagement and awareness. How this is taken up, a particular news article that's framed, discussed, taken up, to me may be interpreted as inspirational and to Richard may be tremendously irksome. So this is complicated all along the way and in any slice in time, many of these things are all taking place. So I think that this model is useful in, in, in starting to break down and provide an illustration of these various processes that take place at any given point in time. And examples of multi-scale contextual factors, the political landscape at a larger scale, we've got mass media consolidation that's been taking place, the feedback, taking place at, at large scales. Uh, ben Bagdikian has talked about in his book, The Media Monopoly, this <coughs> consolidation through time that shapes to scale down to the individual journalist, it shapes how these, uh, how these activities are taking place. And this was discussed yesterday as well. Limits to time, limits to deadlines, limits to space. If you have specialist understanding or if you're asked to cover law, many beats in a given day, in a given week, as was talked about before. So this is part of the, part of the uh, landscape, as it were. I mentioned framing and the power of framing. Just again, the multi-scale dynamic factors, and these are what organize and regulate the production of news. Many people have been talking about this for a long time. Todd Gitlin talked about this in the context of social movements. And Matthew Nisbet and Chris Mooney wrote an important commentary in science in 2007, also talking about this role of framing. What I like to do in my work is, is also situate this in these contextual factors, as I talked about. I put up these, these two um, one cartoon talking about how perspectives do matter here. The second, I'd, I'd ask you, how many raise of hands think that that's a smokestack, first of all? Okay. How many of you think of it as a cooling tower? Raise your hands. So, some other ones, Robert Budd. These are different ways of knowing as well. There is an answer there, right? And depending on how maybe I shift the diameter of the, of the, the stack. That depends on how we are perceiving what is in front of us. So just to give you one example of these challenges, and this has been discussed already before as well, simply language. This notion of within science often we, I guess I can say we, discuss things in, in academic writing with caution. We talk in probabilities. And this does not always translate well to this crisp commentary that's valued not only in the mass media but also in policy and also within the public. I, a good bit of my PhD research was interviewing and talking with many climate scientists, journalists, and policy actors. And from a few quotes of that, first we have Henry Pollock from the University of Michigan, who's written a good bit on this, who talked about the challenge of translating error bars into ordinary language. A second quote comes from Malcolm Hughes, who is part of the Man at All study, part of the, what's been called the hockey stick study, where he says, we scientists are a little too unwilling to say things as we see the misuse of information and policy. I won't get into many, too much depth with this, as I think we've been discussing this yesterday. Um, however, this is part of the push-pull of scientists interacting with mass media, that sometimes there can be a lot at risk, not only one's individual repu rep rep uh, reputation, but also the institutional reputation. And, and there are scientists that do recoil in that, in that pressure. And as Andrew Revkin has often talked about this from the journalist perspective, one of the things working against this, as Jim Henman talked about, that this is a classic incremental story. Typically, these are creeping problems. That is, uh, that is difficult, as I'll show you in just a moment, to, to capture in mass media news. And this sets the agenda. Okay, as Bernard Cohen had talked about in foreign policy long ago, uh, many people continue to say that within this issue that Mass media doesn't tell people what to think, but it tells them what to think about. In terms of one slice of this, interacting journalistic norms and pressures, drawing on what Andrew Revkin had talked about, that there are many factors that, that work from issues, events, and information in the public purview into what becomes news and media coverage. So we've got, this is actually a paper that I've put together with 
uh, my brother Jules Boykoff, who's a political scientist at Pacific University in the United States on the West Coast. The two of us had, had put together this model to depict the various processes from novel issues, personalized issues, and dramatic, <coughs> as well as authority, order, and balance that shape how many of the things happening in our daily lives, the stream of our daily lives, then are translated into what's news. And in terms of the models, there was a question earlier about what kind of models. In the paper that, that this comes from, we, we talk in length about how what's considered this Anthony Downs issue attention cycle isn't, is, isn't adequate in depicting this. Rather, we rely on the Hillgartner and Bosque uh, public arenas model to help us understand how many factors that are happening at once shape how news, uh, how these, how these various issues become news. I could give you many examples. Uh, to take one, Hurricane Katrina, for instance, as Wesley Shrum had discussed with us, a very dramatic issue. There's still a great deal of, of, of legitimate debate within science about the attribution to climate frequency and intensity. Nonetheless, this dramatic, this dramatic influence in the U.S. context raised uh, was a news hook for quite a bit of, of coverage that then linked into climate change during that time. And I might be dating myself here, but this is a bit of early climate change media coverage. This first in 1932 from the New York Times that uh, this just, I put this up here for the historians among us just to say that this is, this is showing that this hadn't, a lot of discussion had been that in the mid-1980s this had come into the public realm, and it's true. But there had been early climate change media coverage for quite a while. Uh, I, I have taken some more recent bits of coverage, and this comes, this piece comes from right in here in the article, and it talks about in 1956, in the New York Times talking about today more carbon dioxide is being generated by man's technological processes than by volcanoes, geysers, and hot springs. On the issue of human contributions to climate change, there's a great deal of clarity in the 1950s as expressed here, and then also in the Christian Science Monitor by longtime well-respected journalist Robert Cohen. He says, industrial activities flooding the air with carbon dioxide gas. This gas acts like the glass in the greenhouse and it's changing the Earth's heat balance. So just to put forward a discussion point, in the late 1980s and in the 1990s and, and so forth, as I've argued in research, partly with, again, Jules Boykoff, <laughs> that there is this politicization of this science that while there had been clarity earlier that climate skeptics, as Richard may be talking about more, had stepped into the fold and had muddled a great deal of debate about specifically human contributions to climate change. So who to trust on climate change? I depict these as climate zealots and climate contrarians. Uh, and for this, I also want to rely a few, an onion article again for you. Um, I do want to, Andrew Revkin has also, I think, said some, has had some important things to say about this. In terms of climate zealots and climate contrarians, in mass media coverage, the extremes, you know, the, the uh, news quotes and so forth, these sound bites come from the extremes. And depending on the issue that we're talking about within climate change, it can take a different shape of a bell curve. So as Andrew Revkin has pointed out before, in terms of maybe is the climate changing, there's a considerable amount of agreement within science, within, within uh, basically everywhere, that, hum that, that the climate is changing, okay? And this can also hold for human contributions to climate change. But at these extremes, you may have climate zealots and climate contrarians that are garnering a good bit of the attention in mass media. And this is detrimental to maybe more of these reasoned arguments. If you look at another issue, just to juxtapose it, action on climate change in the form of the Kyoto Protocol, you may have a curve that's much less pronounced, because there's a great deal of difference of opinion and difference about whether it's symbolic, whether it's adequate, and so forth. So on one hand, we need to, to further refine the content of what we're talking about here, whether it's is the climate changing or humans contributing to climate change or various policy actions. But on the other hand, I raise this to just talk about these two prominent groups, if you will, loosely, uh, very heterogeneous in practice. But in terms of climate zealots, Mike Hume has been writing increasingly about this. He talks about 
in news coverage that mere climate change in the UK was not to be bad enough, so now it must be catastrophic to be worthy of attention. The, increasingly, the increasing use of the pejorative term and its bedfellows of chaotic, irreversible, and rapid has altered the public discourse around climate change. Okay, So this is, this is dealing in this space. So depending, there are cases where coverage is moving out beyond what the science can tell us, and there are other cases as have been talked about. I actually had been one of the authors on the biases balanced study that was referred to yesterday about how this can also be downplayed in terms of this uncertainty to, to emphasize doubt, or doubt is our product, as, as Ted Porter had pointed out, someone had said from the tobacco industry before. I've been moving into some, thank you, been moving into some more uh, research into looking at tabloid news coverage in the UK. And just for a bit of fun, a few uh, headlines that are depicting this shock and awe, these, these headlines that are news grabbing. It's the end of the world mainly for our children, how the world will end from the Daily Mail. If you want to know how the world will end, go to 2002, December 28th. Wave it goodbye, raging floods could swamp our cities within a lifetime. Great whites to stalk UK beaches. For anyone who'd like to do a study of, of great white sharks in the UK, it's just absolutely amazing. You can bet on when the first great white will be spotted in the UK. It's, well, allegedly, right? Yes, there have been many hoaxes also. and 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 claims to that prize. Pollution is turning the seas into acid, okay, referring to the acidification of oceans. But these are some of the news grabbing headlines. Again, who to trust? William Ruckelshaus, had, who's the first administrator of the EPA, had said, if the public isn't adequately informed about climate change, it's difficult for them to make <coughs> demands on government, even when it's in their own interest. Now, some may argue that this is contributing to an information deficit model of understanding about increasing information in the public, but this is also his experiences, and this is part of this complexity of, of understanding about these issues. Stephen Zur, who's written a lot about uncertainty in climate change, has talked about it as used to help construct an exclusionary boundary between the public and climate change scientists, thereby contributing to deferential citizens and diffused public involvement through the accepted need for more research. I could give you many examples, I'm running out of time. Just as one in the New York Times this is one of the watchdog roles of the mass media in this case, where Philip Cooney, who had been the, uh, the uh, White House chief of staff for the CEQ, talk, had intervened in climate change science program documents. And uh, I actually will defer to, for a bit of entertainment, as well as information, as usual, to John Stewart on this. On climate change, I think everyone knows that there are different perspectives on this issue. Blair added, for example, I believe the problem exists. <laughs> now, as far as the president is concerned, you may remember the issue of global warming came up as far back as the 2000 presidential debates. What about global warming? I think it's an issue that we need to take very seriously, but I don't think we know the solution to global warming yet. And I don't think we've got all the facts before we make decisions. Year 2000, we needed to know more about it. Now, in the intervening five years, the president has learned enough about stem cell research, cloning, war, and supply side tax reform to make those decisions. So in those five years, uh, what's his position now on global warming? We want to know more about it. It's easier to solve a problem when you know a lot about it. <laughs> wow! Apparently, not only have we learned nothing new about global warming, he hasn't even learned new words to bull about it with. Why has it taken us so long to learn about global warming? Well, one reason may be that all the money and all the scientists studying the problem had to pass their research through a Bush aide named Philip Cooney, who before working for Bush was employed by the lobbying group, the American Petroleum Institute. According to the New York Times, Cooney's White House job was to vet reports for links between global warming and fossil fuel emissions, and then to make changes to those reports so as to make that link go bye-bye. <laughs> to add insult to injury, those revisions were written in oil. <laughs> OK, so two more slides. Um, the first also to add to this, and I think I'm raising a number of discussion points than, more than answering questions here. Many polls have been taking place discussing mass media influence with climate science and practice. I actually have been involved in one of them 
Uh, I teamed up, our, our group in the University of Oxford has been working with AC Nielsen. This is a 47 country survey. It's about 26,000 respondents. It's on the internet, uh, so it's an internet poll, if you keep that in mind. The question that we had asked them was, what do you consider the most trustworthy source of information about global warming and climate change? And this is across all of the countries, and I can, this is broken down uh, by gender, age, and, and country. But altogether, scientists, 61%, journalists, and mass media, 20 followed by others much lower. So scientists still do remain trusted on climate change, and mass media is in the mix as well. Lauren, I just, Irene Lorenzoni and Nick Pigeon have also done a considerable amount of important work here. They talk about a risk communication strategy based on providing scientifically sound information alone will not be sufficient in itself. Perceptions on climate change are more complex, defined by varied conceptualizations of agency, responsibility, and trust. So again, reconfirming, as they've done empirically time and time again, that this is a complex and contested space. So to finish, a few considerations as we, can, as we move on here. Home country effects. I've been just drawing on US and UK influences, uh, but there are also regional and local effects that in different country contexts, this can be a much <coughs> very different landscape. So in the case of the UK, it's a salient moral issue. I think it's safe to say it, where the, where the Conservative Party in the UK has actually taken, make, made pledges that are often beyond that of the Labour Party. And, and they are pledges, do you keep in mind. It's a salient moral issue where many of the different parties, whereas it's a, it's a, it's a heavily a political issue in the United States. I don't think that comes as any surprise. But the National Journal had done a poll asking about human contributions to climate change in early 2007. And 98% of Democrats had said that they do believe in, in human contributions to climate change, and 23% of Republicans had said that they agreed with that statement as well. And this can also have to do with the entrenchment of carbon-based industry interests. My penultimate point is that of independence, democracy, and the state. As a quote from Sir William Stewart, who'd been science advisor for Thatcher and Major, he said, trust is the basis of good advice. If you don't appear to be independent, you get no trust at all. I'd like to extend that to this notion of mass media. A lot of mass media outlets, many of them are considered maybe mouthpieces for certain parties or, uh, or something to this extent. And this does have an influence, as well as this notion of independence from the state. I'm starting in on some work in the Chinese context with a number of colleagues there and looking at this role of the democratic influences. Last, ongoing socioeconomic, racial, and gender issues that are very important here. Talking about the UK tabloid press is one example. In terms of what have been deemed middle class to upper middle class, so moving up the socioeconomic ladder, 57% of those folks read one of the broadsheet papers called The Independent. And of that upper class, only 11% read which is the most, uh, in most highly circulated uh, tabloid in the UK called The Sun. The Sun receives, has a daily circulation that's over 10 times greater than The Independent. What does this mean in terms of maybe class consciousness or maybe acquiescence uh, to, these, to these issues and arguments, and as well as who has access and who has a voice at this table of ongoing interactions? So I will stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>